This is David Strickmatter uh, conducting an interview for the Kent State National Guardsman Oral History Project, and um, I have a guest with me today. So uh, please tell us, what is your name and where are you from? Uh, my name is Jerry Damero. I'm originally from Akron, Ohio. Uh, I was with the Ohio National Guard uh, in, uh, in Akron, a unit in Akron, uh, I was a sergeant in the C Company of the 145th Infantry Division, uh, and I was a squad leader in that capacity. And I'm also a graduate, and I was at that time a graduate of Kent State. Uh, and how long and in what capacity did you serve in the Ohio Army National Guard? Uh, it was six years, and that was, of course, during the, the Vietnam War. Uh, and that was the obligation you had to be in. You went on active duty, I think, for around six months and uh, then served the rest of that six-year term in, in the National Guard with a uh, uh, summer camp trip to Grayling, Michigan, every summer uh, for summer camp. What led you to join the Guard? Well, I didn't want to go to Vietnam like, like many others. Uh, it was... Uh, you know, not something I wanted to do, and I, I was beginning my career in public accounting, and I was definitely interested in pursuing that. So uh, getting into the National Guard was a way to allow me to pursue my career uh, and do some graduate studies at Kent State as well uh, and, and not go to Vietnam. Looking back, how do you view your time in the Ohio National Guard? Uh, it was very troubled times in our country and certainly in the Akron, Cleveland area. Uh, so I definitely feel I've, <laughs> I've satisfied my obligation uh, to, to my country. Uh, you know, during that time, there were, were race riots going on in both Akron and Cleveland. And actually, right before Kent State, my unit was already on active duty because of uh, the uh, Teamster strike where rioting had broke out. So uh, we, we were already in active duty, and they just moved us over to Kent State when the incident happened over there. Uh, and what are your memories of arriving into Kent, Ohio, in May 1970? Well, it's an interesting. Like I said, we were, we were already on active duty in Richfield. or We were camped out in Richfield, Ohio, and things with the Teamsters had, I, I guess, quieted down quite a bit. And uh, I'd asked my company commander if I could have Saturday night off, uh, and that would have been what May second, I guess, uh, because my company up in Cleveland was having their big spring dinner dance, and I'd sure like to go to that. And things were calmed down; it didn't look like anything was going to happen. Uh, with the Teamsters, so he readily agreed to let me have Saturday night off. So, so I packed up my car, went to Cleveland, and uh, was at the the dinner dance when we heard that students at Kent State had burned down the ROTC building. So I thought immediately, uh oh, uh, here we go. Uh, but I, I had the night off, and I, I, thankfully I went home and went to bed and went back to Richfield, Ohio, where my unit had been. And, of course, as I expected, they were gone, so I kept on driving uh, into Kent. And I still remember entering campus, and the, uh, the ROTC buildings were still smoldering, or the remains of them were. And there were a lot of people in National Guard all over the place. I had a little bit of trouble finding my unit, but I did find them and and settled in. And they had us pitch our tents on the, uh, the what was in the football field. And so we did that. And I remember the governor, the Ohio governor, was on campus, and he he gave a, a talk about. Uh, you know, what was going on, and uh, I, as I recall, it was kind of a stern talk, like, uh, you know, they, we're not going to tolerate uh, this kind of behavior, which, of course, with the violence of burning down the building, that was understandable. But we had the, the rest of the afternoon off, and uh, that evening, these students were assembling on the front corner of the campus, uh, in front of what was then the library. It's not the library anymore, but 
uh, on the front corner of campus, and we were ordered to go down there, and we were in a line. This was Sunday night, May 3rd, in a line kind of perpendicular to the library, and uh, we found ourselves surrounded on all sides by by students and demonstrators, uh, and I remember the uh, officer in charge told us to kind of, you know, one person stand facing one direction and the other person stand facing the exact opposite direction because we were surrounded. We had to kind of keep an eye on both sides so we wouldn't get attacked, and it was a frightening uh, situation. We were down there, uh, you know, with, totally surrounded. Uh, there we were with loaded rifles and fixed bayonets, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of fear at that point in time. Um, but we, at, at some point in time then, uh, were ordered to kind of get lined up uh, together and start pushing the students up towards uh, Franklin Hall on campus. Uh, which we did. We had, and I guess we were throwing tear, tear gas because we had tear gas masks on. And I remember it's, the students were throwing rocks at us, and uh, it was a scary, scary situation. I've often thought it was it was it was surprising that the a, a shooting didn't happen that Sunday evening because things were a lot more threatening, and uh, the students were a lot closer to us at that point in time, or at least closer to where I was. But anyway, we, sho we shoved the students up around campus, and things sort of dissipated. Uh, but we were ordered to stay on duty guarding one of the uh, residence halls up there because they didn't want the students, once they got back into the residence halls, they didn't want them to get back out. So we were kind of just up all night on guard duty, if you will, uh, trying to prevent them from reassembling and doing something else. Uh, morning came, and that was May 4th. It was a beautiful, beautiful day, and finally they let us off and said, okay, you can go, to, go back to your tents on a football field and catch some sleep. And I remember I was about to do that and crawl into my tent because uh, I was pretty tired. And uh, the company commander <laughs> came over and said, hey, guys, uh, they'd like us to go up uh, around the commons area on campus, which is a big, wide open area that uh, is kind of at the time was kind of in the middle of Kent State. It's not the middle anymore, but uh, orders us to go up there. They said the students are going to be assembling. We think it's going to peace, be peaceful, but we we want you to kind of be, be on guard between the students and the uh, the burned out remains of the ROTC buildings. Uh, I guess I don't know what they thought they'd do to the ROTC buildings because they were. They were pretty much gone at that point in time, but they said, you know, not to worry. You'll be able to go to bed after this is all over, so just come on up and, uh, you know, and, uh, yeah, you know, it looked pretty peaceful. I didn't see anything too much going on. I remember one of the one of the young uh, women on campus uh, put a flower in the end of the rifle butt of one of the National Guardsmen kind of down the line from me, so everybody seemed to be kind of in a in a peaceful, jovial mood. Uh, Jovial probably overstates it, but at least there was, certainly wasn't anything uh, threatening going on at that point in time. Uh, the uh, the next thing that I recall happening is that, and I don't know who this was because there were several National Guard units there at the time, uh, and I I was on the far left hand of the line as we faced Taylor Hall up at the top of the hill. Um, but the next thing I remember is a Jeep uh, going around uh, kind of on the commons area between us and the students with a loudspeaker basically telling them to disperse, which, of course, they didn't do. Um, and then, you know, after some period of time, we were kind of standing there, and I, I remember there was some Ohio State Highway Patrolmen to my immediate left, and man, as soon as things started heating up, they were pretty crisp and bright, but they, man, they came to attention and marched straight off, of the, and that's the last we saw of those guys. Um, the, uh, and I don't blame them, I don't, we, we weren't very well trained for this kind of uh, situation, and I, my guess is they weren't either. Uh, but at any rate, we, uh, got the command to disperse the students, put on our gas masks, and were lobbing gas at them, and pushing them up towards Taylor Hall. Uh, 
And, of course, when we got to Taylor Hall, the National Guard line had to split and go around the building. And the, the guardsmen who did the shooting went around to uh, the right of the building, and my side of the line went around the left. And I remember when we got around the the other side of Taylor Hall, uh, I was kind of relieved because, you know, the students were looked to me like they were pretty dispersed, and I thought, well, th- things were over. And the next thing that happened, my, my company commander, uh, uh, Captain Snyder, Ron Snyder, uh, ordered us to get back beyond, kind of on the side of, uh, of Taylor Hall. And uh, I wasn't sure why at the time. I found out later that the reason he did that was he saw the guardsmen at the top of the hill uh, pointing their rifles at our direction. So it was for our own protection that he did that, thankfully. Because uh, we, at the time when we were, before he executed that order, we were pretty much in the area where Jeffrey Miller, uh, the student, had been shot and killed. So uh, we were we were definitely in harm's way. So we're behind the building, and like I say, I wasn't sure exactly why, but then all of a sudden uh, shots rang out, and it seemed like a a relatively short volley, but I did remember uh, bullets ricocheting off the dormitory to our left, which I guess is at Verter Hall. At any rate, uh, you know, we'd all been on firing range duty, so I know what bullets going overhead sound like. And uh, my first thought was that they were, you know, for some reason, firing over the students' head to, you know, frighten them and disperse them. Uh, but but then the next thing I remember, and this seemed to happen very quickly, there were just ambulances all over that back you know, part of uh, uh, Taylor Hall, and uh, and we, you know, we were we were still kind of on the side of Taylor Hall, and uh, Captain Snyder uh, then took several of, uh, I think maybe three or four uh, guys from our unit to go up around, and I think surround Jeffrey Miller's body, and that I think that was the famous uh, photograph that, uh, you know, with the runaway girl that. Uh, I think became you know, famous after after the incident happened, um, but but they came back and we were standing there and we were told, well, the students are reassembling on campus. We have to go back down to our original position uh, between the students and the burned out ROTC buildings because they're they're back at it again. And uh, so we got down there and I remember. At that point in time, and I don't, I don't know how they did this that quickly, but somebody, one of the dormitories over there to my right, uh, some of the students had gotten a bed sheet and uh, probably spray painted uh, effing murderers on that. Uh, and that was kind of hanging out of the side of the dormitory. And the students were uh, reassembled. Uh, I didn't know exactly what was going on, but it was a really a frightening, frightening situation, uh, you know, because of what had just happened, obviously, with all the, all the emotions on both sides were very high. So um, we're standing there, and I, you know, fortunately nothing happened. Of course, we learned later that one of, one of the uh, faculty members there, thankfully, uh, talked to students out of, Doing anything, and uh, ultimately they, uh, they 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 went away, and 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 that was over. And the next thing that I think happened after that, they they took us all into one of the dormitories, into the dining hall portion, and uh, gave us something to eat. And I I still remember they were they had music that was being piped into the to the dining hall, and. A couple of songs, uh, uh, Bridge Over Troubled Waters, I think it was Simon and Garfunkel, and the Beatles' Let It Be were playing. And, I, and those songs, for me, will ever be burned into my brain and associated with Kent State. And I, I hear them, and all those emotions and feelings uh, uh, come back. But uh, we were we were in, in the uh, dining hall for a while, and... Uh, I'm not exactly sure what, how the timeline went, but we never did get, uh, get back to the football field and bed. And uh, that that evening, this, the evening of May 4th, uh, we were told that, and I think it was the Students for Demo- Democratic Society, SDS, was going to 
come and kill, or they had threatened to come and kill two National Guardsmen for every student that had been killed. Um, and of course, that was kind of a frightening thought. And uh, anyway, they they took us up uh, to kind of surround uh, Taylor Hall for some reason. I, I, I'm not exactly sure what they thought was going to happen over there, but uh, we were all positioned around uh, Taylor Hall. And the next thing I remember, in the, in the far distance, there was a, this huge fire, and I, you know, we looked at that, and I thought, oh my God, here they come. But as it turned out, and we found later, that was for some reason a barn uh, had caught fire, and that's what was the fire we saw. But I'll tell you, at the time, it was it was kind of frightening. We thought, you know, the uh, the SDS or whomever is going to be coming after us. And the next thing that happened, we were kind of sitting there on on the hill um, by Taylor Hall, uh, facing what was then Lilac Lane, which is a kind of a walkway between the dormitories and some of the uh, classroom buildings on campus and it's kind of a bushy area and uh, I heard rustling in the bushes and uh, my squad was to my left and all of a sudden I heard click 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 they were taking the safeties off their rifles and I, I remember saying to them men hold your fire <laughs> as a good thing because all of a sudden a, a man appeared you know out of the bushes and I went over and asked him who he was and it was a reporter of some sort I escorted him back to the uh, to our command post and told him, I said, you, you're awfully lucky you came close to getting shot because uh, no one's supposed to be up here. Uh, that was kind of the, the end of uh, that evening. Uh, I don't remember when I finally got to back to bed. I think they let us go the next day. It was, it was been March 5th, I think. The campus was totally closed down, of course, and I went back home to Cleveland. Uh, and uh, that was kind of the end of the incidents on campus. The, the only thing I remember after that, and this, this was some time, and I'm not exactly sure how long anymore, but the grand jury had been convened, and uh, uh, one Saturday morning uh, there was a knock at the door of my, my home and <laughs> went to the door, and there was a guy out there with a suit on, which I thought was kind of strange for a Saturday morning, but it was a federal marshal with a subpoena to, so made me, subpoena me to testify in front of the uh, the grand jury, which I which I did, and and I testified to the grand jury that I I didn't think the uh, the shooting was justified based on what I saw because of what I said before. I mean everything looked you know pretty dispersed when I got around the side of Taylor Hall, and I was kind of relieved. So to me it was really surprising and shocking that. That the shooting took place, and then when I found out that they weren't actually shooting in the air, uh, that was, of course, very, very troubling. But uh, that's uh, that was my experience, and it was very painful. I, I really couldn't talk about it for a while, uh, for a long while. It was just uh, pretty, pretty traumatic, of course, and uh, the the students that lost their lives and those that were injured and and crippled because of that it, my heart goes out to them because it was uh, I still believe to this day that the shooting was was totally unjustified. How do you feel about Kent State today? I mean, you you had been a student there, and then of course you were in uniform uh, when the shootings occurred. Well, I think, you know, when I graduated from Kent State, I think like many, many graduates, you have very, very warm, close feelings for your alma mater. And I, and I certainly did then. I had, I had, and I still have a lot of, lot of close friends and fraternity brothers that, um, you know, that, that were, that were friends of mine there. My wife's a Kent State graduate, so we have a lot of mutual friends that are, are Kent State. But, but the events of May 4th, Kind of robbed me of those warm feelings of uh, about my alma mater, and I, I still I still like Kent State. I still care about it. I've been back there. Uh, we were back there uh, two years ago. Uh, uh, we had we had some uh, musical instruments that we uh, made, contributed to the Department of Music there, and and at that time, I and my wife and I both went back to the commons area and I talked to her about it and we 
we walked across the common, the same, the path that I had walked, uh, that day on May 4th and the, the emotions just really, really come back, uh, and uh, and actually, when you, when you contacted me and and uh, asked me to do this oral uh, interview, uh, you know, Kent State's not one of the things I think about often, but uh, I started thinking about it, and the, those old emotions uh, come back. Not certainly not as intense as they were a long time ago. It's been 50 years, so that's one of the one of the real blessings that our, our mind doesn't, uh, you know have the same depth of, of, of feelings after that period of time. But uh, but I guess the, the shootings and the May 4th incident uh, did rob me of those, those deep, warm feelings of my alma mater. Um, how often have reporters or historians uh, tried to reach out to you uh, over the years in regards to Kent State? Uh, not at all, really, other than maybe one time, uh, I think I did speak to somebody, uh, very, very briefly, uh, and that's been quite a while ago, so I'm guessing maybe that was three, four, five years after, after May 4th, 1970, uh, when I did, well, it was, I, I say, the interviewed would probably overstate it. It wasn't certainly as extensive as what we're doing now. And that's the only time I remember it all. When you were on campus uh, with the guard, did you recognize anyone uh, from your student days? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, no. Uh, are you I'm st- to- are you still in touch with any of the other National Guardsmen that you served with? Uh, my company commander and I are. Our Facebook friends. <laughs> There's another uh, fellow from uh, my hometown, actually, which was Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, which is a suburb of Akron. We're Facebook friends. That's that's about it. I've lost track of a number of them. Some of them are not with us anymore. I know that. Uh, but no, we have not. Or at least uh, there may be some up in the Akron area that are in contact with each other. But uh, uh, that's that's been the extent of my current contact with any of those folks. The narrative of the Kent State shootings that is often told um, castigates and vilifies the guardsmen at at some level. Um, Do you think that narrative is is fair to the guardsmen? Well, as I said, I don't think the shootings were justified. I mean, I'm as horrified as as others that that it happened. I mean, it. it, uh, it but I think you, you, the the blame is not not simply with the guardsmen that did fire. Although I would I would I would I would be critical of them because certainly there were lesser measures if they felt something threatening they could have been done other than firing. Uh, I guess they were M14 rifles at the time. Um, but I think I'd, I'd also be critical of the command structure of the guard because, you know, those students were assembling on campus. Everything was pretty peaceful. Uh, they were exercising their constitutional right of free speech, and I don't think there was any compelling reason to order them to break up in the first place. So if that hadn't happened, if they just simply had allowed them to give their speeches, do their talking, get those, you know, that energy and those emotions out. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's where the problem started. And the problem, I think, another part of the problem is how ill-equipped and how, tr- how poorly trained we were for any kind of situation like that. I mean, gosh, uh, loaded rifles and fixed bayonets uh, are pretty harsh uh Solution for students exercising free speech on an American campus. So I think I think the, the government bears a lot of responsibility on what happened that day, as, as well as those who fired. Who, like I said, I I don't I don't I couldn't see anything that would even come close to justifying firing weapons at students. You said you were 
subpoenaed and that you testified that the that you felt that the shooting was uh, not justified. Did you did you experience any uh, backlash uh, from uh, the National Guard uh, organizationally or, or from fellow guardsmen? Uh, no, not at all. And I I, uh, I think those that testimony is all all um, not public anyway. So they. I don't think one way or the other would have known what I said, but no, I, there was never any kind of backlash like that. And I, the ones that fired, I think, and I'm, I'm not totally sure of this, I think there was only one guardsman from my unit who ended up on that right side of a, a line that said he did fire, but he, I remember him saying that he had, he had fired in the air and uh, had not fired at a student. So the ones that did, did the shooting were not part of of uh, of my unit at all. Uh, and after you uh, testified, how closely did you follow the the trials? Uh, well, I uh, you know I I uh, don't recall for sure, but I'm sure I, 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 my guess is I would have followed them pretty closely because you know I had been involved so. But I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, go, attempt to go to the trials. I was working and probably working, I was in public accounting, so I was probably working pretty long hours. So. Um, and finally, over the years, um, now 50 years removed, I mean, have your feelings about what happened, have they changed or have they uh, remained Pretty, pretty consistent since since the event. I don't think they've changed one bit. I didn't feel it was just the shooting was justified at the time, and I still to this day don't feel it was justified. And uh, yeah, I don't that hadn't changed a bit. Uh, and is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, perhaps a final comment on uh, for this interview. Well, I'm hopeful that that this process that you're going through, uh, you know, will will provide some documentation of uh, what happened, and uh, you know, hopefully we don't make these same mistakes again. I mean, that's if there's any, there's a lot of lessons to be learned out of what happened at Kent State, and I hope we learn those lessons and don't don't repeat this kind of thing again because. Uh, you know, for, for pretty obvious reasons. I mean, there people lost their lives. Innocent people lost their lives. Uh, people were injured and, in some cases, maimed for the rest of their life. Um, that there there has to be a better way to handle handle situations like this. And uh, I hope we can learn those lessons and uh, allow people to exercise free speech. And uh, you know, certainly not. Fire uh, loaded weapon, give loaded weapons to uh, lightly trained uh, National Guardsmen as a way of, uh, you know, ending a, a situation like this.